Brought to us by Shoebill Storks. Somewhere along the way, the person in front of me had started chanting, Correlation isn't causation. Correlation isn't causation. When we reached the front, we fanned out, standing right in front of the lectern, in plain sight of every single person in that hall. We, a group of fat people, danced in front of this group of obsidy researchers to the music. It felt scary and awkward, but also glorious and amazing. At no point during any of this did the keynote address stop. The beats of fat affirming music competed with this unceasing monotone grind, the soundtrack of conflict. Shoebill Storks replies to his own thing. This entire article almost reads like a sock puppet trying to make FAs look even more ridiculous. But it comes from a very active author on a body positive site, who seems to have a lot to lose. Ms. Beaver. Since it's Virgie Tovar, a well-known public figure, on here you don't have to hide who wrote it. Disrupt her pistol, and at the end of the story, she ate a large piece of cake, and everybody clapped. This whole story is very embarrassing. I don't know if it actually happened, but if it did, it's very weird. Research conferences are not exciting places. Going there to protest isn't going to reach anybody in the news, really. It's not going to help your cause in the slightest bit. You're just going to annoy a bunch of uh, graduate students and professors who are going to think even less of you in the future. I mean, is that her goal? To get people to take her less seriously? Because that's what she's doing. Brought to us by ra 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 Fat cells. Overfill them and they will always return to their original size and more after dieting. If you enjoy food, then you will fill them, as I have. They have memories, scientific fact. Only way to stop it is cure childhood obesity. Adults don't usually suffer as much if they were healthy weight children. What a strange example of using bad logic to reach a good conclusion. Here's an example to show you what it's like. Cars have feelings. Humans keep building more roads and cars, but we shouldn't play God by creating living things. Therefore, we should build more safe bike paths and subways. Our lesson found an ad for intermittent fasting according to zodiac sign? Geminis are supposed to eat one way, Libras another, etc., etc. Curious chemicals, good lord. I would think this is satire, but it's an ad, which means somebody actually paid money to waive IF strategies based on zodiac signs in front of people. Do you think anyone is a committed enough troll to pay for a joke ad like this? Did you click to find out? Naked Lobster. I hold my hopes out that it's a scam. Additionally, it looks suspiciously similar to the diet fear blood type and diet fear fingerprint type ads I've seen. Is he joking about the diet fear fingerprint type ads? Additional trash brings us something from an intuitive eating group. I need some encouragement tonight. I had bariatric surgery almost four years ago and lost a significant amount of weight. Since then, I've had two children and gotten a good handle on my eating disorder. I pulled out some of my two big clothes that I was trying to sell, and I thought it looked like they could fit me now. Sure enough, I'm trying so hard not to spiral. I should have tried them on. I have no idea what I weigh, and I'm working with an intuitive eating, anti-diet dietitian, who is helping me manage my PCOS, which has recently returned after a few years in remission right after my surgery. But I know that I'm wearing only one or two sizes down from my original size, and that is making me feel like I'm doing something wrong? But I feel healthy! And I'm working on repairing my relationship with food. Can you all help me reframe this or think about this better? I don't need to lie to myself, but I do need to find a way to think about this in a positive and realistic way. Also, those clothes are very cute. And if I didn't have a history with them, it wouldn't have bothered me that much. Thank you. Let me put the story in simpler terms. I used to get headaches. Then my doctor told me to stop hitting myself in the head. The headaches went away for a short while. But when I went back to intuitively hitting my head, the headaches came back. How can I avoid both headaches and helmet culture? Jaro Games brings us. Also, being big doesn't mean being unhealthy. Sumo wrestlers are great examples of that. Edit. If you're going to comment stuff like sumo wrestlers aren't healthy and they live 20 years less than the average lifespan, then STFU, because... You think you're helping, but you're actually not. I'm tired of getting 10 plus comments every day talking about the same stuff. Good grab. So in a nutshell, the OP cherry picked really bad stats for his or her side, posted it, realized being dead 20 years earlier looks bad for fat activists, 
then doubles down. Is this satire? This is so stupid, it feels like it's satire or something. Dragon Ox. I see this lot mostly in conspiracy theorists. No matter how much evidence you show, or even if they prove themselves wrong, they will still believe in BS. Majestic Butterfly brings us. I need to lose weight because I want to live longer for my kids. Diet culture sells a lie that fat people die early, but the evidence just isn't there. In fact, the opposite is true. Please consult the previous post about sumo wrestlers for some evidence. Anyway, good grab replies. FAs, I'm the most healthy person ever. No one is healthier than me because I'm fat. Also FAs, I don't know you health. So what if I have sleep apnea, joint pain, high blood pressure, and type 2 diabetes? That's not related to my size because skinny people get sick too. Starlurker adds, 20-year-old FAs versus 30-year-old FAs. Open breadfruit brings us. I'm used to American fat phobia, but damn, European fat phobia is a whole other level, bro. I don't know about other countries, but France's normal diet is disordered eating. They don't believe in snacks. Erdor replies, The snack industry in the U.S. is out of control and is fueled by capitalism. Corporations don't care that their product is making people obese. People definitely don't need snacks, lol. Also, I visited France and stayed with an older French woman for a few days, and she definitely had snacks. She just didn't eat Cheetos for a snack. She would eat bread and cheese or fruit. I saw her eat a tomato sandwich between meals one day. Gangsta Gastino adds, It's a common snack in Italy, too. It's called it's called pane pumuta in Ligari. It's day fresh bread with garlic, tomato, basil, Evo oil and salt. It's a really common children's snack, too. Lozang Kunfen brings us something that seems like parody. The diets we follow and intense exercise we do are often assaults on the body. We exercise in these practices to control and dominate the body, often without the body's consent. OCR Amazon, a body does not consent. The mind inside it does. These folks sound legitimately deranged. Psychic Mudkip, what does body consent look like? That would be my question. Mostly our Amazon. The only time I would say that my body does not consent is when I'm trying to do another chin-up and my muscles are failing. Lol. Sarcastic Scientist brings us. Diet culture celebrates disordered eating. It's a picture of two women. Wow, you look great. Looks like you've lost weight. Halcyon Hearing replies to each of these memes as he goes. For this first one, he goes, Thanks, my fitness has improved too. The second thing the FA wrote, I admire your discipline for exercise. Healthy on hearing, Haha, it's just about making time and finding some exercise you like doing. The FA writes, I wish I had your willpower. I can't stop eating like you can. I just keep treat foods out of sight, out of mind. The FA, Tell me about your diet. You're so skinny. Healthy on hearing, I just try and eat lots of leafy veggies, a side of meat, eggs, Greek yogurt, seeds, fruit, and nuts. The FA, you must have the best genetics. You're so thin. Healthy on hearing, it's also just how I grew up. We didn't eat a lot of fast food or fizzy drinks. The FA, bottom line, I'm urging everyone to let go of the control that diet culture has over society and allow themselves the freedom of life without body insecurities. Healthy on hearing, Bottom line, cosmetic culture also has a control over society, but I'm not crying a river because when I try contouring, I end up looking like a fairy that's just had wisdom tooth surgery. After finishing that one, I'm not even really sure what the fat activist's point was. Did they have one? Watermelon Ascot brings us another one with about seven PowerPoint shots to it. Things we've been told are health culture that are actually just skinny culture. Giant salads as meals. Salads as entire meals are a modern pursuit. Leafy greens and salads can certainly have their place, but they are not calorie or nutrient dense enough to serve as an entire meal. Stevie Crafts replies, actually, salads had their origins in ancient Greece and Rome. Theophile Escargot adds, I think I linked to this description of an actual Roman banquet a while back from a letter by Pliny the Younger complaining about someone not showing up. 
Pliny writes, Who do you think you are? You agree to come do dinner, but you don't come. The judgment is passed. You must pay my cost to a penny, and this is not moderate. All was set out, a lettuce for each, three snails, two eggs, wine with honey chilled with snow. For you should include this too among the high expense, since it dissolves on the plate. And there were olives, beets, pickles, onions, and countless other things, no less neat. Was Pliny the Younger the first Karen? Anyway, the F.A. continues. Volume eating is bulk eating foods that are really low calorie. For example, giant bowls of veggies. It completely ignores our body's needs for energy in the name of losing weight. Again, low calorie vegetables have their place, but they are not meant to be the majority of your diet. I'm probably going to reply this to everything they say, but prove it. Prove that low calorie vegetables are not meant to be the majority of our diet. Fasted workouts. This can be a fast track to damaged stress hormones. Hormones can't get damaged, and metabolic function, especially for women. Exercise can be done in a way that is entirely unsupportive, and I believe this is one of the biggest offenders. Again, prove it. I've never heard any evidence for this. The sugar-free craze. Completely avoiding all sources of sugar, and especially replacing it with artificial alternatives, is one of the biggest disservices the health industry has ever given us. Natural sugars are supportive to our health. Aspartame is not. I don't think most people complain about natural sugars. They complain about added sugars. And in most cases, added sugars are not helpful to most people. So much dang lean chicken. I'm not saying don't eat chicken, but it's impossible to get all the nutrients your body needs off chicken alone. Poorly raised poultry store, unstable fats in their tissues, and lean chicken in isolation causes us to miss out on necessary fat-soluble vitamins. Who is she arguing with? Who are these people that eat only chicken and nothing else? Drinking gallons of water. While it is important to be hydrated, over-consuming water with no minerals is further flushing our mineral stores. Hydration can also come from fruits, milk, broth, and soups, coconut water, and fresh juices. It can, but in general you should be avoiding juice because it's not that healthy for you. And I'm not sure coconut water is much better. As long as you're not drinking ridiculous amounts of water, in general, drinking water is pretty good for you. Majestic Butterfly brings us. You know who's still watching their weight? The 95-year-old lady in the nursing home who passed on her birthday cake. The dieting mindset can literally last until the day you die. No better time to change that mindset than now. Before I read the comments, assuming the story's even true, I'd like to point out that the woman is 95 years old. Reaching that age is no mean feat. Egg watching replies, I work for a 94-year-old woman sometimes. She still lives in her own house that she has lived in for 74 years and is completely independent. She cleans and cooks, takes care of her yard, and still drives. She'll sometimes ask me to eat lunch with her or drink a cup of coffee when I'm at her home working, and she eats so healthy. No sugar in her home, pretty much all meals made with loads of vegetables, very little carbs, and everything made from scratch. She's in amazing shape, and her brain is super sharp. Obviously, when it comes to aging a lot, it's due to genetics, how hard your life has been, and just the luck of the draw. But your lifestyle is also so extremely important. I've always been scared of aging, but if I age like her, I won't mind at all. Alfaba, my grandma will be 91 this year, still lives on her own, drives, in good health, mind as sharp as a tack, the whole works. She's a bit frailer now, especially since we lost my mom to cancer last year, and she's taken to comfort eating so we're actually the same size. But I'm nine inches taller. But she admits that it's not healthy, and she's working on losing the few pounds she's gained. She's glad my family feeds her, though, because she hates cooking. Somer Louise also adds, My great-uncle lived to be 95. We used to call him Mr. Fitness. He would walk and walk every day. He enjoyed food, but usually would splurge on something expensive like lobster or salmon once a month, rather than a daily trip to McDonald's. And aside, Lobster and salmon are not that expensive. Continuing, he absolutely would have turned down an overprocessed sugary cake. I guess we should feel sorry for him, at least according to FAs. Urarara brings us. OOC, weight loss shouldn't be the goal. Your body has something called a set point, which is the weight your body is healthiest at. That is not the definition of set point. 
Set point is the weight your body will settle at if you eat natural foods. No junk. Continuing. When you try to lose weight, your body does everything it can to keep that weight, and often trying to lose weight will make your set point higher because your body doesn't know the difference between a diet and starvation. It's healthier to stay at the weight you are and listen to what your body is telling you. This was told to me by doctors and dietitians. I gotta ask, were these reputable doctors and dietitians? Or were these doctors and dietitians also trying to get you to join their MLM? Healing Hatriarch replies to this part. Trying to lose weight will make your set point higher because your body doesn't know the difference between a diet and starvation. That makes no sense. You don't stop eating and start hoarding food during a famine. You may be rash in your food, but you don't stop eating. I've used this example before, but the way these people think the human body works is that our bodies are essentially doomsday preppers with massive sheds full of water and non-perishable food, but in the event of an actual doomsday, they will starve to death because not only are they not eating the food in their storage shed, they're tossing what little new food is coming into that storage shed rather than eating that. Also, you have to carry your storage shed around on your back all the time. If the human body was that stupid, we'd have gone extinct a long time ago. Also, by this logic, people should be gaining weight right before they starve to death. Ms. Beaver brings us. Your weight is none of your business. It's your body's business. Stay in your own business. When you're trying to control your body size, you're in its business. Your body is wise, intelligent, and can take care of itself best when we listen to it rather than control it. When we focus on health, our body will rest at a size right for it. Not what we have been taught is right. We have just learned not to trust this. Download this free guide to body acceptance, five actions to start you on the path. Next up in my summer group coaching series, Showing Your Skin. Join me and others as we do the work to feel more comfortable with our skin. Learn more at blank. Private eight-week body acceptance coaching. Highly personalized support tailored to you. Link in bio. Ve Poignier replies, Sales pitch for intuitive eating. Download my free guide. Join my workshop. Get personal coaching. Blah, blah, blah. Let me teach you how to believe that being too big to leave your house is your body's wisdom at work. Venmo, PayPal, and major credit cards accepted. And to think these people always denounce the diet industry for preying on the vulnerable. Good grab. It's only evil capitalism when someone else does it. When I do it, though, it's okay. Because fat phobia and patriarchy. Witty understanding brings us. Healthy eating might be only eating bread at dinner. Ugh, I gotta stop there. Come on. Only bread? That's your main meal of the day? Only bread? I don't know what kind of work a person would have to be doing to need that level of carbohydrates with very little fat and very little protein. There's no way that that's healthy for 99% of the population. Next, eating five pieces of pizza for lunch. I'm going to have to stop again. That's a lot of calories to eat for lunch unless you're at a two-meal-a-day plan. If it comes from a restaurant, that's easily over 1,000 calories. Unless you're a very active man, or an extremely active woman, that's way too much food for lunch. Having cookies for a snack, and it shows five cookies. So, this person, in theory, is eating five pieces of pizza for lunch, eating five cookies, then eating a whole bunch of bread, then I assume eating five cookies again, before their midnight snack of more cookies, and I forgot their breakfast, which I assume is a giant bowl of cinnamon toast crunch. Anyway, and then they finish. Healthy eating involves listening to internal cues. It's not about specific foods or rules. This one's for tossing replies. I think the word they're looking for is pleasurable. These are examples of pleasurable eating. These people really weirdly conflate a basic understanding of nutrition and nutritional values with branding food groups as amoral. As if the rolls aren't going to church on Sunday. Little bit crunchy. Well, junk food does traffic in dopamine and endorphins, and hijacks reward systems. So maybe those foods should stand trial. Blue is the sky brings us. Wait, prediabetes is fake? Please say more! Yes, from my understanding, prediabetes is a neutral body state. Yet another category medical practitioners made up to fearmonger and further taxonomize human bodies. There is no guarantee a prediabetic body will develop diabetes. 
I don't think medical disclosures are always necessary or helpful, but I will share this as my understanding as someone who does not currently have diabetes or pre-diabetes despite a lifetime of soda drinking and living in a 400 plus pound body, allegedly risk factors. If I'm driving toward a cliff, it's not 100% certain I'm going to drive over the cliff, but if I ignore the fact that people are telling me I'm going to fall, drive over the cliff if I keep going the way I'm going, then I'm kind of an idiot, much like a person who ignores the fact that they have prediabetes. Blue is the sky, replies. There's no guarantee, sure, but experts estimate that between 70 and 90% of individuals diagnosed with prediabetes will eventually develop diabetes. Given that diabetes is a potentially life-threatening condition that can impact quality of life, this kind of rhetoric is very concerning. Jewish Space Medbeds adds, And I have a feeling that 10-30% to 30 of individuals who do not progress to diabetes don't, because they implement the recommended lifestyle changes to prevent it. My aunt, for instance, was told she was pre-diabetic and made a few simple changes that corrected her sugar levels within a few months. The kicker, she didn't even need to lose any weight. She just made healthier food choices. That one Spice Girl adds, Yep, my parents both got diagnosed with pre-diabetes around the same time. My mom reversed it and has been totally pre-diabetes free for two years and counting. My dad, on the other hand, is struggling because he refused to make the same lifestyle overhaul that my mom did. My mom has been 110 pounds sopping wet her whole life, too, before, during, and after the pre-diabetes time. Tom Marvolo Riddle brings us. Bear with me here. This is a bit of a weird connection. I just watched season one of Heartstopper and I couldn't stop crying. I'm not a TV crying person, especially not a happy TV crying person, but for some reason I just kept crying at all the sweet parts, which I also did for Our Flag Means Death, and that got me thinking. Why do I, a mostly straight cis woman, identify with and find so much more catharsis than LGBT plus stories? Why do I find queer romances to be the most moving? Am I really cis? Yeah, seem to be. Really straight? Yeah, for the most part. So what is it? And then it dawned on me. I'm fat. I know that seems a bit of a weird stretch, but bear with me. That feeling of being other, especially growing up in a romantic settings than your peers? Yep, we've both got that. Constantly facing hate and discrimination for a part of you that you have no control over? Yep, got that too. That inability to express your interest in someone unless you know they're attracted to your type of people, lest they be repulsed by the mere idea of your attraction to them? Got that one as well. Knowing that, just because the other person likes you, it doesn't mean that they'll be willing or ready to endure the bullying they will face if they actually publicly date you. We've even got that one, too. I'm not trying to co-opt LGBT plus struggles or media, or say the two things are remotely the same. We face very different systemic discrimination and oppression, but it suddenly occurred to me how many themes seem to resonate with both. I can only imagine how much these themes are doubly powerful with fat people in the LGBT plus community. So what do you think, fellow fat people? Do you find this to hold true in your experience as well, or is this just a me thing? I had to go through a lot of comments to find somebody who didn't attack the original OP. Electrical Tooth had a pretty good reply. Aight, I'm bi and fat, quickly becoming less fat, woot, and a dude for context of where this reaction is coming from. I think that besides the stupidity of fatness being out of their control, they are touching on something real. If you truly believed your fatness was an unchangeable trait, then seeing other people overcome the discrimination they face could understandably resonate with you. Love stories that also show someone overcoming great challenges and pain, pain that you connect with to whatever degree, would naturally be very moving. I feel bad for OP, and I think this connection runs the risk of overstating the relative hardship faced by fat people versus LGBT plus people in terms of social stigma, rejection, violence. OOP is trapped in the self-destructive, unhealthy mindset, and a lot of people don't escape it. I never thought I literally couldn't lose weight, like on a math equation level of sicko, but I did start to feel like I was just too weak and stuff to ever make the changes to myself as a person to grow discipline or mental strength because I had failed to do so, so many times. Elmir 2000 brings us. I wish I could eat whatever I wanted. Well, actually you can. What you really wish is to live in a society that doesn't harshly judge fatness. 
I see. So we're just completely ignoring any health effect being overly fat would have on you. I see. I see. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Cool, 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 cool. She continues. Most often when people say, I wish I could eat whatever I wanted, what they really mean is I wish I could eat whatever so that I don't gain weight. I'm not talking about people who have food allergies. If we dig underneath this statement, we will usually find the subtext, because I don't want to be judged negatively by others for having gained weight. I was watching an episode of a cooking show where the chef's specialty was making cookies and pastries. This chef was thin, and she unapologetically ate a lot of sweets. Not only did it show, once again, that body size has a genetic component, but that we judge people who are fat and eat sweets is so different than how we judge people who are thin and eat the same foods. What would be preferable is if we lose the judgment altogether, because this is the fear that is holding so many people back from eating how they would like. It also can have the side effect of binging on these foods if we restrict ourselves from eating them. As much as I would love if people stop judging others for what they eat and their body size, waiting for this to happen is a fool's errand. A much better way to focus our energies to stop judging ourselves for what we eat, and more importantly, stop judging ourselves for our body size. If we truly want to eat something and enjoy it, only we can give ourselves permission to do that. Not saying it's easily done, but it's the only real control we have and a much more empowering approach. For more information and resources on learning to accept your body and weight neutral approach to health, download my free body acceptance jumpstart guide by clicking the link in my bio. Ugh, that's another one of these people. Let me see if I can make money off other people's insecurities. True Crime Fanatic replies, They have this notion that some people eat 5k calories a day, do nothing, and are magically thin. Meanwhile, they barely eat, lies, and gain 10 pounds. Genetics gives us a frame. We hang the picture on it. I'm a tall woman with broad shoulders. Even at a healthy BMI, I'm a big woman. I can't help that I'm built like a damn Clydesdale. But I can't control how much extra fat I carry on this body. I've lost 80 pounds in the last year. My only regret is not doing it sooner. Seal brings us Content Warning Capitalist Fat Shaming Hey y'all, not Cottagecore, but this is the only group where I feel safe talking about this. I'm currently wedged into a seat on a plane from Amsterdam to the USA and started crying because I barely fit. Read, don't fit without my hip lifting the armrest and can hardly get the seatbelt to latch. How do y'all deal with this? I mean, it's everywhere. Chairs don't fit us, but this is expensive. For the cost of an international flight, a person should expect a seat that accommodates them without having to pay extra for an upgraded seat or buy two seats, and the average seat width is down to 17 inches, formerly 18.5 inches, so it's getting worse. I texted my partner in tears, and he went off how sick it is that capitalist greed makes people feel this way, trying to get more money out of customers, rather than treating them like human beings. He's the best, and I appreciate it, but I still hate this feeling. Gentle reminder that most people, including me, cannot afford to pay for first business class upgrades or even to front the cost of two economy seats with the expectation that the second seat will be refunded. And again, even those of us who can afford it should not have to pay more than our smaller fellow travelers. The tips on Southwest and other airlines offering free reseating to give extra space are great. It seems they learned their lesson after the catastrophe with Kevin Smith, which is gratifying. I don't actually know the complete story with Kevin Smith here, although I know he was avoiding Southwest for about seven years or something because he was too fat to fit in their seats. Although some poop muncher replies, My brother in Christ, it's capitalist greed that made you fat in the first place. The following story is about how sugar addiction can ruin your life. I had a bunch of numbers posted in Today I Messed Up. I'm sorry, I just needed some word event as literally everyone is saying I'm a D for kicking my pregnant ex out over this. To clarify, this is not the first time she's done this, but this time it cost me over $1,000. Also, I'm sorry if this was choppy. I'm seeing red right now. So recently I got two massive orders for pastries for two weddings and a few other parties. I had spent one week working with my team on the orders as it was 75 to 100 per item. Well, we finished yesterday, and I and the team decided to go to the movies and just relax. Big mistake. My now ex had a party planned, without asking me, in the home. I pay for her while she just sits on her butt doing nothing. She's never had a job. She just waits for everyone to hand her what she needs. Why is an offspring song suddenly coming to my head? 
We recently found out she's pregnant a month and a half ago, but she's been using it as an excuse. At first, it was just one or two of them, but gradually it became more. One to two became fifteen to twenty, which wasn't an inconvenience as it was only one more batch, and I was fine with that. However, yesterday was the last straw. When I went out, she threw a party with fourteen of her friends. And they got hungry, so they made their way down to the shop and went through nearly everything my team made. My dad owns the bakery. It's not too far down from our house, so it wasn't that hard for her to get in. Well, when we came back, we found my ex and 14 of her friends wasted on nearly $1,000 of pastries. I nearly lost my stuff and started screaming at her, asking what the heck she was doing and why she thought this was okay. She blamed this on pregnancy cravings and tried to say that she wanted the baby to eat well. But when I asked about her friends, she said they also had cravings. I kicked her out and had to call and explain everything to both parties. Full refund for both of them, as there was barely anything that could be salvaged. Too long didn't read. I left products alone while I went to watch a movie, and came back to my ex and 14 friends completely wasted on over $1,000 of it. Wasted here means high on sugar. Update, she ended up calling me on her parents' phone about 7 to 8 a.m., screaming at me for posting our private lives for everyone to see. She then proceeded to ask me, through crocodile tears, if I would press charges on her and her friends for having fun. I replied yes, and as I was about to hang up, she brought up the child, as to which I told her to get a paternity test or it will not be my problem. She then starts trying to manipulate me and gaslight me, crying, saying it was just her being hospitable to her friends, and it was rude of me to yell at them and kick them out. She then proceeds to cry about me not caring about her, and I just hung up and blocked her. As of right now, I'm fixing to leave for the police department, and I hope you do come, Maddie, with the evidence I have. You'll be arrested on the spot. Doesn't seem likely she'll be arrested. Doesn't sound like she broke in. Sounded like she had a key. At best, he'll have to sue. The next one's more about not treating someone like dirt just because they've gained a little weight. Sarah Fluoride put it together. It was originally posted by Dog Eat Dog. My husband, who's nine years older than me, met about six years ago. We've been married for one year. When we met, I was very fit and athletic. I started gaining weight, however, after suffering two miscarriages and the loss of my mother to cancer. I was very depressed and barely got out of bed, if not, to go to work. I stopped exercising and instead started eating junk food. I gained 40 pounds in two years. Under this time, my husband, then fiancé, was very supportive and loving. I felt guilty and tried to give him an out several times, but instead he proposed and we got married last summer. Since our marriage, I've been feeling much better and it showed. I have lost about 20 pounds so far and I gained back my muscles and abs. He was so happy to see me feeling better. On his computer, however, it was a totally different story. He was talking almost under our entire relationship to his ex about me. His ex-wife left him about seven to eight years ago for her colleague. The relationship didn't work out, however, and she tried to get back together with my husband. She has already met me, but they stayed friends, mostly via chat, texting since she lives 12 hours away. My husband was complaining about everything about me, my job, my depression, my cooking, but mostly about my weight. He was telling her how disgusting I was to him, how we found it hard to share the same bed since I snored like a dog. He sent her pictures of me while sleeping, sometimes in underwear, with comments about my belly, double chin, back boobs, etc. She found these pictures extremely amusing, and she came up with the name White Whale. They both found it hilarious, and now this is what they referred to me as. They don't flirt exactly or talk about being together or starting an affair, but they do say that they miss each other, and they reminisce about the time they were married. She's more flirtatious, and he really enjoys it. Whatever he's telling her isn't what I've experienced with him. I don't disgust him. He tells me that he loves me all the time. We have a lot of good times together, so he must be a really good actor. If he was in reality disgusted by me, and he hates the few times we have to sleep apart. He's lying, and I don't know why he's doing it. He's lying to one of us, and I'm not sure I want to know who he's lying to and why. I decided to get out of this marriage and leave this behind me. Right now I'm acting like everything is normal, but I have started to look for a new job in another city and a place to rent. I also started with birth control pills, in case something happens between us, and I have talked to a lawyer to prepare the divorce and start the process once I'm gone. One thing I'm not going to do is fall back into depression and weight gain. I will not allow it. What a waste of love he has been. And then Doggy Dog made an update. Hi again. 
I'm feeling happy, so happy for the first time in weeks, and wanted to share that with you. Since many of you supported me and requested an update, I thought it would be the decent thing to do. So here goes nothing. I don't pry or spy on my husband. I used his MacBook to do some work, and he had forgotten to log out from Facebook and Messenger. He has never given me any reason to spy on him. After I found out, however, I would occasionally check his phone, maybe hoping that it was all a bad joke. He continued complaining anyhow, and now he was telling her I was being distant and cold in manner, and that he was tired of me. He even lied and told her I was gaining even more weight, even though I'm not. He told her we aren't having sex. I avoided him, because he couldn't find it under the rolls of fat. A joke that she highly appreciated. I didn't spy after that. I got the confirmation I needed. In the meantime, he acted the worried husband with me, concerned about me and asking if I was going through a new depression. He told me he loved me and that he was there for me. He did everything like previous times I had dips. Called from work, came home with takeouts from my favorite restaurants, did all the cleaning and washing around the house, baked fresh bread in the mornings. He keeps getting her takeout and baking her bread, but at the same time says she's overweight? Man, this guy has got to get his brain worked out. He also brings flowers and chocolate. Ugh. Come on, he is, is this guy dumb? And asked if I wanted to go for nighttime drives, walks. He used to take me for a drive the night I was feeling very down and depressed. How can anyone be so two-faced? I have my big sister who lives in another city. I told her that I was leaving my husband and that I was looking for jobs in her city. My sister is married, and she lives with her husband and daughter in a big house. She offered me one of her spare rooms. I got a few job interviews, and one of them turned into an offer. It's not exactly my field of work, and it comes with a significant decrease in salary. But I thought about it, and it's a good start until something more suitable comes up. I didn't want to prolong my stay with him any longer, and a decrease in income is a good sacrifice. Plus, I'm going to have lower rent, and I'm still selling my car since the new job is walking distance from my sister's house. No more worry about crazy gas prices. My new job starts October 1st. I'm working my notice period for my computer. The two months between jobs, I'm just going to have fun and work on myself. I took my name off the lease, but I'm going to pay two more months. I left him last Sunday. The night before, I prepared him a very nice dinner and made whoopee. It felt so good to hear him whispering how much he loved me and how lucky he was to have me. In the morning, I left the divorce papers and my attorney's number in the kitchen. When I got to my sister, I finally could tell her and the rest of my family about everything. I showed them all his conversations and even the pictures he's taken of me. They're all pissed at him. He's been calling and texting obsessively, but he doesn't know where I live now. He went to my parents, but they just shunned him at the door and advised him to let me go. Maybe he knows now because he's been asking to explain and apologize. I don't care. All I've texted back is that if he wants to convey a message, he could do it through my lawyer. This next one is about an obese person not respecting boundaries. Am I the jerk for making my sister-in-law feel like poop about her weight? I'm 35 and my sister-in-law is 46. I have three children, the oldest being 16. For my birthday last week, my son went out and bought me the swinging hammock chair that I've been wanting for two years and it cost him quite a bit of his saved money, which I fully intend to put back into his bank account so he can continue saving. He was so excited to see me open this gift and couldn't wait to help me set it up. I told him he shouldn't have, that it was a lot of money, and his response was, you never get anything nice. I wanted you to have it. And it was true. I usually don't get anything for my birthday or Christmases outside of Tupperware or soaps. So it might sound stupid, but I've cherished the swing ever since he got it for me, especially where I finally have something nice that's mine. My sister-in-law comes over once a week to see all of us, and she immediately headed straight out for my swing, which my son hooked up on her deck. I told her to please not sit on it, and she said, is there a weight limit? So I told her, yes, 250 pounds, and I even showed her the box to confirm. She was not upset about this. She just said, that's a bummer. They need to make something capable of holding us big girls. I simply agreed with her and went about my business. At this point, my husband shows up from work. When I went inside to grab us some drinks, my husband and her are talking on the porch and not even five minutes later I hear a loud crash and my husband says, Hey, are you alright? I go out and sure enough she had sat in my swing and the crochet netting around the hook snapped on one side, causing her to fall right on her butt. She was sitting there laughing, gets up and says, I guess I need to learn to listen. So I lost it. As I said above, I literally never get anything nice. Never. This is the one thing that I had that was mine 
and it didn't even take someone a freaking week before they ruined it for me. So I said, I literally just told you that not even 20 minutes ago that it would not hold you and to please not sit on it. She makes some comment about, usually the weight limit is a lie, I thought it would hold. So I said, the weight limit probably would have held if you were only 50 pounds heavier than it, not 150. She is 420 pounds because she's one of those girls who eats food on camera for money and she absolutely loves her weight. But regardless, instead of apologizing or offering to compensate me for my destroyed item, she has resorted to saying I'm a poop bag for making her feel like her weight is a problem. And my husband is on her side? It's just a swing, he says. If he really thought it was just a swing, he would just buy her a new one. And so another video comes to an end. Thank you very much for making it this far. I was looking at my members list this week, and I was surprised at how many people are members. I want to thank you all very much. I truly appreciate it, and I know you don't have to support me. Extra special thanks go to Emmett McNally, Rig, Cupcake or Death, MMC, Story Story, Megatran2000, Cly, That One Guy, and Laura Christine. And very quick thanks go out to Sonia C, Courtney Kreps, Jenny G, Dalf Malk 65, Just a Girl, No, Caroline Han, Ash, John's Doter, Dis Merart, Gina Senna, Sodium Cyanide, Starry Pajani, Chris in Real Life, and Olympic Grade Lurker. If you're still here, consider clicking like and subscribe. And if you really want to support me, consider becoming a member. Members at the max level get one mini bonus Fat Logic video every two weeks if I can find material for it.